morning, church. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Listen, um, I don't know about you, but I'm still uh, just uh, I'm, I'm still just kind of reeling off of our Easter services last week. A special thank you to all that served. Uh, super blessed. We had over 125 people simply serving last weekend alone. So thank you for, for just being a part of that in, this, in that way. And so now we're on to the next thing. Who is ready for the eclipse tomorrow? You know, we just get the sun, and now it's going to be blocked out from us. You know, what is up with that, folks, right? What is, what is up with that? Um, God is, is, is toying with us, right? Um, and so with that being said, let me just grab my table over here. Um, we have to get ready for um, just, uh, just uh, that we don't burn our retinas out um, tomorrow as well. And uh, that would never be a, a good thing. But I hope you all are ready. It'll be an interesting sight to see. Did you know that they're predicting that it's over $1.5 billion of revenue coming in for tourism alone? Right? Not, that's not just our area. There's a whole pathway. But isn't that crazy? Just to watch the sun get darkened for a little bit? I mean, that's crazy to me. I mean, if you, that's, it's, that's your thing. That's your thing, I guess. I don't know. It's not necessarily my thing, but it's all right. Um, with that being said, though, we're going we're gonna to get into a new teaching series today. And, um, and uh, it, uh, you're either going to hate me or love me, probably the former of the two. I don't know. Uh, but we're going to talk about something that nobody likes to talk about. Look at somebody and say, money. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I get it. You know, you've probably experienced preachers or pastors or seen things on TV from televangelists before. And it's like, that's just an area I don't like to talk about in the church. Some people have been uh, even messed up from, from that or experiences that, that had taken place in the church or in, 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 in wrong ways in terms of, of, of money. But I want to talk about the biblical approach to money because God has a lot to say about it. And, and, and you know what? Money is a part of how we live. And so we've got to, we've got to honor God in terms of how he, he lays things out. So this is going to be a series on finding freedom in our finances and biblical stewardship, and we're going to lay this out in the next couple of weeks. With that being said, I can remember at the end of 10th grade, beginning of 11th grade, the common question was, what are you going to do next? What do you want to do with your life? It's a big question, right? I don't even do my own laundry. I don't prepare any of my own food, but yet I need to figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Where are you going to go to college? What career path are you going to take? It's hard for me to decide, again, between the choices of what I'm going to have in the, in, in the lunch line, pizza or a hamburger today, let alone the rest of my life. But when it came down to it, I thought to myself, Never a, a wise idea, by the way. But I thought to myself, I just want to make money. It's before I got into the ministry, by the way. Um, whatever job is out there, I, can, I, can, I, I want to I do really well for myself financially. I'm going to pick that. And so I started to think, you know, maybe, maybe I should go into medical school. I was thinking about being an eye doctor, and I thought, you know, eight years and then two years in residency. Anybody that's done something like that, God bless you. I'm just not sure I could have the wherewithal to do that. So I decided on finance and business and kind of the accounting field. All that I, I got into, all, the only reason I did was because I wanted to make bank when I got out of college. That was a deciding factor for me. Not what I necessarily wanted to do, not what would be somewhat fulfilling, not how God designed me to be. I made the decision solely because I, I believed I was going to make money. Money, though, listen, it has a voice. It speaks, talks, it draws, it lures, it convinces Money reasons. It's not a rich or a poor thing or a middle class differentiation here. Money speaks to everybody. The question, though, that we're going to ask today is, is the voice of money the prominent voice in my life? Does the voice of money outweigh other voices? Does it outweigh the voice of your kids who would much rather have you time spending investing into them rather than the 401k? 
It's great to have retirement, don't get me wrong. Nothing wrong with that, but does it speak louder than your family? Does it outweigh the voice maybe of your marriage, your husband or your wife? They, they need you to be home, they want you to be home, but the office wants to make sure that this project, this deal, this moneymaker, it's locked tight, all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Not to mention you could get promoted if you do really well. You could look much better, make more money if you serve the deal tirelessly. Nothing wrong with working hard, being diligent. That's good. That's godly, actually. But at the end of life, nobody ever said that they wish that they would have spent more time in the office. It's always with, I wish I would have spent more time with people. Maybe it outweighs the voice of wisdom. I really, really, really want that new car or that new furniture or those new clothes, but I can't afford them, so I'm just going to put it on credit. Or the voice of, maybe I can get rich quick. I'll gamble a bit here or there, take a risk or two. Why not? Money has a way of convincing us to follow its lead over God's lead. Money talks, but so does God. Who wins? Who wins in that area of your life? What voice is louder? Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to ask ourselves that question. Does God's voice or, or does money and materialism win out as the most influential voice in your life? We'll discuss what God says about money because he says actually quite a lot. There's uh, over 2,300 Bible verses, scripture alone that talks about the almighty dollar and possessions in life. About 15% of Jesus' teachings dealt with money. There was about a third of his parables that he spoke on money because money talks. And you have to understand, though, that money in and of itself, it's actually morally neutral. It is. It's not bad, nor is it good. Just like a television or the internet or social media isn't necessarily bad or good, it's what you do with those things that could be bad or good, right? The voice of money in our lives can stir up some unhealthy desires. It can cause us to do some things that don't necessarily please the Lord. It can be an area of our lives that, that, but also that brings glory to God. And so money in itself, it's, it's morally neutral. Not only that, though, God can use money to test our motivations. Oh, it's true. And we're going to discuss that today. He can actually grow us in being more like Christ with attitudes that look more like Jesus and godliness than the spirit of this world and worldliness. In this series, we're, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about biblical stewardship. We're going to talk about an attitude of generosity, contentment, and we're even going to, we're even going to talk about tithing. Today, I'd like to dive right into a story to help us to recognize the voice of money Versus the voice of God. And just to give some context, Naaman, he's a Syrian general, an enemy of Israel, traveled to the land of Israel because he had heard about a man, a prophet of God, who would cure him of his leprosy. God is the healer, but he sometimes chooses to use men or, or women to be vessels of his healing power. This was the case for Elisha, a prophet of God. Long story short, Naaman came to Israel. He was healed after some reduction of his pride. And Naaman then offered Elisha financial and material gifts, but Elisha refused. See, Elisha was not going to turn God's miracle into his money grab. So Elisha politely sent Naaman on his way and said, no, thank you. But there was another man who thought to himself, well, if Elisha won't take the coin, well, I'll volunteer. <laughs> How thoughtful. Let's read about this story. 2 Kings chapter 5, starting in verse 20, it says, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, See, my master has spared this name in the Syrian and not accepting from his hand what he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. I mean, you could see here that, that Gehazi really was sacrificing, wasn't he? It's like, what a good sport he was. You know, I, I, 
You know, I don't want, I don't want Elisha to look bad, so I'm going to go take the money. Right? That sounds rational. Uh, but he goes on, and he says, so Gehazi followed Naaman, and when Naaman saw someone running after him, he got down from his chariot to meet him and said, is all well? Gehazi said, all is well, but my master has sent me to say, there have just now come to me from the hill country of Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothing. And Naaman said, be pleased to accept two talents. And he urged him and tied him up two talents of silver into two bags with two changes of clothing and laid them on two of his servants. And they carried them before Gehazi. And when he came to the hill, he took them from their hand and put them in the house. And he sent the men away and they departed. He went in and stood before his master. And Elijah said to him, where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, your servant went nowhere. But Elisha said to him, did not my heart go when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Was it a time to accept money, garments, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male servants and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever. So Gehazi went out from his presence a leper white as snow. Money was talking and Gehazi was listening. See, money has a way of getting you to justify actions that are less than honest. They're less than best. Let's take a look at Gehazi's infractions for just a moment. First, did Gehazi have anything to do with Naaman's healing? Nothing. It was Elisha that was being used as the instrument of God. Elisha. Elijah made it also abundantly clear right afterward that he would receive no money for a miracle. Elisha knew that money was talking, but he refused to listen to the voice of money. He wouldn't do it. Next, Gehazi thought to himself, that may just be the worst thing that you could do, uh, by the way, when you start to think to yourself. It actually says, Gehazi thought to himself. Just a little word to the wise. Stop thinking to yourself. All right? Stop it. All right? Look at somebody and say, think to God, not yourself. See, we got to do a little bit better in terms of, 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 of bringing our thoughts to God rather than just thinking to ourself. Because thinking to ourselves... It doesn't always get us in the best places. Can I get an amen? <laughs> right. All right. We get this bunch of ideas as to why we don't want to think to God or we think that God's going to somehow take something from us, or especially in this area of money. Our money or an opportunity he's going to take away from us and, and God's going to make us miserable. That's not necessarily how God is, all right? So but we don't like to consider God in this area of our lives because what is mine is mine and what is God should be, what is God's should be mine, Right? Stop thinking to yourself about your money and start thinking of God. He can do so much better than you can with your money. The problem is you don't really trust him. Let me just say it that way. All right? You don't trust God if you don't allow yourself to think to God about your money. Third strike for Gehazi. He crafted a plan of falsehood. He deceived Naaman. And he made it sound great. Oh, these couple guys just, they came in, they're in need, you know, and, and, and we got to help them out. Elijah sent me to come get you. I mean, completely a false narrative. Completely wrong, right? For this powerful man. And then he tried to deceive his boss, Elijah, afterwards. And when confronted about this, Gehazi, he lied even more. Did you notice when the servants came back with Gehazi, it says they came to the hill. They didn't go over the hill. They came to the hill because Gehazi didn't want the, the servants of Naaman to come with them so that Elijah could see them. He's like, I got it from here, guys. Let me take it, right? So he lied to Elisha because the voice of money will convince you to act on its own interest rather than what is true, what is noble, and what is good. Now you have one person in the marriage hiding debt, 
or taking loans without the other person's knowledge. Now you're confronted to, 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 to report certain earnings on your income taxes that you prefer to keep hidden. Now you're confronted with fudging the numbers on an estimate so that you can get the job. We do things and we falsify things when it comes to money. Money talks. And Elisha knew, like when a mom knows and can't, you can't hide the truth from the mo your mom. She's got eyes on the back of her head, right? You know what I'm saying? That's, that's Elijah right here. And he asked Gehazi, is this the time for a money grab? Is this really the time to pad your numbers? Is this the time to make a profit? I mean, look around at us, Gehazi. Look at our nation. We're not in a very good spot. And you're trying to, you're trying, you're trying to make bank here. You're trying to be all out for yourself. Oh, man, election's coming. Good Lord. It's the time where we're, we're, we're all about what we can get from this government. Good Lord. Dear Jesus, help us. Gehazi's deception revealed who it was that he was serving, and it wasn't God. I need you to, to listen to this. If you don't hear anything else today about what I'm saying, because you block me out because you don't want me talking about money. I, I get it. Maybe you don't like that a preacher's talking about money. Maybe you've heard and seen some things before that, man, they're just they're like, I don't know about that. Or, or, or there's preachers trying to rip you off. That's not what I'm doing. I'm not that guy. And I actually care about your soul and the voice of money and how it can actually affect your soul. Because you can't really walk in the freedom of Jesus Christ. And that's my biggest win in my life when I see people walk in the freedom of Jesus in whatever area of life it is. Because money can steer your life. It can start to push you in directions that's not healthy. If you're not going to hear anything else that I say, then I'm just going to ask you to hear this. Hear this. The voice of money always overpromises, but it always underpays. It always overpromises, but it always underpays. Every single time. Elisha knew who his provider was. It wasn't Naaman, it wasn't the government. It wasn't clients or patients. It wasn't his education. It wasn't his own abilities. It was God. And if God said no, the answer was no. Money overpromised Gehazi, but underpaid him. Because those two talents of silver and those four pairs of clothes would not take care of the leprosy that he was now going to receive. Gehazi didn't know that he was now walking into a life of poverty simply because he listened to the voice of money over the voice of righteousness. I mentioned before that when I went to college at first, my decision solely was based on making money. Apparently, my thoughts were on money because there was another opportunity that arose uh, my first semester going to college. One day I entered my biology 101 classroom. It was a big auditorium. It had over 300 seats in it. And on every single one of those 300 seats, there was a little piece of paper, a quarter-sized piece of paper that had some writing on it. And these pieces of paper asked a question. It had a phone number on it, but they asked this question, and this, was, this is what caught my eyes. Do you want to make $13 an hour? And I thought to myself, why, yes. Yes, I do. You see, it was better than the $5.40 an hour job that I had. Minimum wage plus a quarter. I got a raise at some point, right? And so I thought to myself, what an opportunity. I'm going to go to college here. I'm going to get this now job to make $13 an hour. I'm going to be rich. All my troubles and college woes are going to be gone. This is my big break. So I called the number. I signed up for the training. And at the training, guess what I learned how to do? Sell knives. <laughs> but the catch was, in order to sell these knives, you had to showcase these knives. And so you had to buy a set of these knives. How nice of them. 
Oh, come on, I wasn't going to say it. You know what I'm talking about. And making $5.40 an hour, I didn't have an extra 500 smackaroos laying around to buy this knife set, right? And, and with that was going to thrust me into this new beginning. But the problem was I already quit my $5.40 an hour cents job for this promise of a lifetime. Not a smart idea. You see, I listened to the voice of money telling me that this would give me a better future without thinking to God. I thought to myself. And we can all do that, but hopefully we start to realize what that voice is really speaking in our lives and we can recognize the difference between God's voice and the voice of money. Because the voice of money over promises but always under pays. It will leave you in predicaments that you didn't want to be in if you didn't take the time to think to God. Money is not evil, but serving it is. Thinking to yourself about it rather than thinking to God about it will cost you every single time. Listen to what Jesus said about money in Matthew 13, 22. He's sharing a parable and he's talking about the conditions of our hearts and one condition of a heart He's talking about is a heart where the word of God is sown into the soil, but it was sown amongst thorns. And this is the person that hears the word of God, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, because it talks, it speaks. Guess what those things will Come up around the, the word of God in your life and it'll choke it out and it'll make your life unfruitful. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches directly affects your ability to hear God's voice in your life. And your soul, your inside person becomes profitless when you listen to the voice of money over the voice of God. Jesus is saying a person who gets led by the voice of this world and money ends up living a life that ultimately will be wasted. It's not why he created you and it's not what you're designed for. There's so much more in life that God has for you than making money. Jim Carrey, the actor, said, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so that they can see that it's not the answer. And I say, good point, Jim. If you'd like to help me try to become rich and famous, I will try that out. <laughs> In all reality, he came to the place where he realized the voice of money and the prominence associated with it never fulfills. There's a deceit behind the voice of money. It gives you a false impression every time. The voice of money tells us, with more, life will be easier. Ever think that before? I certainly have, but it's not, it's not necessarily untrue, but often when we get more, we spend more, and we're not really any different in the long run. More money can actually lead to more problems. You know what I'm saying? More money, more problems. More money, more, pro more problems, right? You, know, you now have more responsibility to take care of. Uh, take care of. All right? Not only that, this kind of deceit can, can say other things, too. If I had more, then, well, I, 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 would, I, I would be better off in life. Well, that is not necessarily true. It's not true at all. If I had more, I would be, a, I would be, I would be better off. No, you know what Warren Buffett says? He says, listen, if you were a jerk before you got a billion dollars, you're going to be a bigger jerk when you get a billion dollars. It doesn't make you any better. It doesn't change your character. Not only that, the, the, the deceitfulness of rich, riches also will, will, will tell you that your future will be better. And you know, that's not necessarily true. Because you might strike it big. You might... You might say, oh, I'm going to be happier because I just made more money. But guess what? The very, very next day, you get that terminal 
illness report from the doctor. It's not going to make your future better. It doesn't necessarily make your life happier. Jesus shares another, another parable. Actually, yeah, he shares another parable in Matthew 26. or another, There's another story about Jesus. And it's a woman that came up to him with an alabaster flask, a very expensive ointment, the scripture says. And she poured it on his head and uh, just emptied it out on him. And when the disciples saw this, the scripture says they were indignant, saying, why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she's done a beautiful thing. For you always will have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring out this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. She's the only one that knew what was really up, what was going on. In verse 13, he says, Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in this whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelves, listen to this, one of the twelve right after this experience whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what will you give me if I deliver him into your hands? And they said, 30 pieces of silver. There's a lot of significance of just that alone. I don't have time to get into it. But then he went away and he looked for the opportune time to give Jesus over. One person, Judas, was deceived by the voice of money. Another person, this lady with this expensive ointment, listened to a better voice regarding her money. But it was this, it was this last straw for Judas because he saw this experience and he saw this woman waste all of this on Jesus. And he thought to himself, I want that. I, I, want, I, I, want, I want people to waste stuff on me. He realized that he wasn't really getting any further along in his bank account and following Jesus. And he'd been following him now for a few years, walking out the purposes of God, who is a part of it all. Miracle after miracle, he saw God move. Jesus asked him to do different things, and he was part of the team. Wow. God uses the voice of money in our lives to reveal what you value most. Judas valued money over Jesus. Jesus was not a treasure in Judas' Judas's life anymore. In stark contract, we find this woman who poured out her most prized possession. This alabaster flask of expensive perfume was wasted according to the disciples, but invested worthily according to Jesus. And, and just as, as an aside here real quick, stop judging other people and their offerings unto God and how they're giving unto the Lord. It's not about you. It's about their heart and what they're giving unto the Lord. So stop throwing out your criticisms towards people and judging people accordingly in that way. Church history tells us that this flask or this jar would have been pure nard, worth an entire year's wages. That would be about 300 denarii, which rounds out to about 55K in U.S. wages. Wow, 55 grand she poured out in one moment on Jesus. Her devotion to Christ was both sacrificial and selfish. She valued Jesus more than what she got from this perfume. She trusted Jesus with her future completely. This could have possibly been her, a wedding dowry for her. It could have set her up financially if she got into a tough spot. But she poured it out on Jesus. And for Judas, for Judas, he left to make a, a future for himself in a way that was lucrative to him. But ultimately it led him to his own demise because the voice of money always over promises but always underpays. Just the other night I heard my six-year-old daughter, Finley Grace, try to buy a slinky from her older brothers. 
They, didn't, they don't care about the slinky. They don't want it. Some old toy, I'm sure. But she doesn't have any concept of the value of money. She's throwing things out there. I'll give you $5 for that. I'll give you $10. I'll give you everything in my piggy bank for that slinky. You know, I'm, I'm thankful that my sons um, didn't oblige her, right, and rip their younger sister off. And, you know, that's, that's a good thing. They're, they're, they're good. They're good kids. Now, if they would have, though, um, she would have kept the slinky and she would have gotten her money back, right? Because that's just how it works. But, but listen, God uses money to reveal what we value most. For Finley, it's a slinky. Do I value God over money? How about over my marriage? How about over my health and relationships? How about over our God-designed purpose, our true fulfillment of life? Do I value money over those things? This is another story that we all know too well, Luke 18. We've shared on this not long ago, but a rich, young ruler. Guy has it all. He's doing well. I mean, he's young. He's got prestige. He's got affluence. I mean, he's got the following. He's got it all. He comes up to Jesus. He realizes he's missing something. He says, good teacher, what must I do to, to obtain eternal life? He was beginning to realize the voice of money didn't, didn't promise him true life. Didn't give him eternal life. It didn't give him abundant life. Didn't give him real life. He was empty. This thing was, he was unfulfilled. So Jesus coached him in the moment, and he offers him eternal life. He offered him what eternal life is, is an opportunity to come follow Jesus. That's where you find eternal life. It's not in just a little prayer that you say to reassure yourself that you're saved. It's, it's, it's that your, your heart so much believes it, your mouth so much confesses it, and that you, your actions begin to show it. Eternal life comes from following Eternal life whose name is Jesus. And so Jesus offered this guy eternal life. And in verse 22 he said, but there's one more thing that I, I want you to do because there's something tripping in your life right now. It's tripping you up. And, 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 and this is what you need to do. One thing you still lack so that we can take care of. You continue to follow me in, in your life. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. When this guy heard these things, he became very sad and because he was extremely rich. This young guy didn't realize the greatest treasure was not in his bank account, but it was staring him in the face. And that's another reason why God uses the voice of money to test your commitment level. This young guy decided that it was too high a price to pay to follow Jesus, to give up all of his wealth and his possessions. And that's it's a difficult thing for any of us. Our temporary comforts and desires so often outweigh our eternity and the true riches that God would want to give us. Nobody said following Jesus Christ was easy. But Jesus looks for commitment. Commitment is a deliberate decision. It's a determination regardless of feelings or even of circumstances of, of a situation. Because so many times how we feel about things or the situation, the circumstance dictate the voice that we follow in our lives. Too many times we throw out the grace card or we say that Jesus understands why I'm doing this. And no, no, you say, no, this was actually a commitment test in your life, and you're missing it. And so often people forsake following Jesus into the unknown because the voice of money and stuff has too high a grip on us. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and what? money. Jesus saying you just can't do it. It's impossible. He breaks it down. There are two leaders in this life. God or money. And you can't serve them both. He told the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3 and he wasn't holding back any punches. He's saying, guys, listen, you say that you're rich and you're prosperous and that you need nothing. But I'm coming to you out. I'm saying you're actually wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, 
You're naked. The voice of money actually can blind you to your actual condition. He taught this in another parable in Luke 12. He he said, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But Jesus said, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? Jesus didn't even want to get involved in the family stuff. I mean, whoever wants to get involved in that, right? And Jesus said, take care and be on guard against all covetousness. How much covetousness? For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produces plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do for I have nowhere to store my goods? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I'll store all my grain and all my goods, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So this is the one who lays up so much treasure to himself and is not rich towards God. Jesus uses the voice of money to expose covetousness in your heart. Why did Jesus teach this parable? To guard, to help us to guard from covetousness. It's a big thing. Don't dismiss it. The voice of money convinces you to covet and Jesus is saying, watch out for covetousness. But that's not what we do. We, we, we do the exact opposite. We, we go to all the stores just because we want to go shopping and look for things that we like and that we want. We scroll through Amazon. Oh, what, what can I get here? We're not in the, the market for, for a new house. But we're constantly looking at all the houses that pop up on the market. We have so much stuff in our houses that we can't even stand it. And then we say, oh, where did all this stuff come from? (laughs) Let me just just throw some stats out to you. In 2020, just four years ago, the annual industry revenue for self-storage units was more than $39 billion. Today, there are over 51,200 facilities of self-storage units in the U.S., And over 65% of self-storage users, they already have a garage. The average occupancy rate for self-storage units is over 96%, meaning they're almost at full capacity. Lastly, the United States comprises 90% of the global self-storage inventory. We got all the stuff here in the U.S., and we don't know where to put it. I'd say we're not really on guard against covetousness in our society. There is an article in The Atlantic six six years ago that shared how online shopping and cheap prices are turning Americans into hoarders. 2017, Americans spent $240 billion, twice as much as they did 20, 15 years earlier, on goods like jewelry, watches, baggage, telephones, related equipment, all of that. Spending on personal care products also doubled over that time period. Americans spent, on average, $971 on clothes last year alone. 66 garments per person. That's 20% more than they spent in 2000. That's what the average American does. The the average American buys 7.4 pairs of shoes last year, which are up 6.6 pairs of shoes since 2000. Now, I know what you're thinking. Wow, Pastor, you look like you got some new shoes on today. And I do. (laughs) But you know what? It took me a, a year and four months to go and buy these. So you just get off my back and stop judging me. It was birthday money that I received over a year ago that I had put away for shoes. It took me that long to get them, all right? We all know that Jesus is laying down the truth. Are we listening? We live our lives to collect and get and desire, but the, great, the, 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 but the greater matters, the treasure of Jesus and his kingdom, does that matter to us? 
one of the most influential objects in our society. You're thinking it's going to be the cell phone, but it's really the credit card. They became a reality in the 1950s and have grown in influence ever since. The credit card gives a false reality that you can purchase something even if you don't have the money for it. The first day that I went to college, when I entered the common area, it was lined with credit card companies and tables displaying all that they could had and what they would give you. They're going to own you right from day one. They're there to ruin people's lives. Seriously. It ruins your life. It's far too easy to get credit cards. You can't have mine, though. <laughs> Richard Stearns of World Vision shares a little uh, story in his new newsletter. There was a three-year-old girl from Rochester, New York, received an application for a platinum Visa card in the mail. Three years old. It so amused her mom that she filled it out, listed her daughter's occupation as a toddler, and left the income line blank. But she wrote on the application, I like to have this credit card for, for some toys, so I can buy some toys. But I'm only three and my mommy says no. The credit card arrived in the mail two weeks later. <laughs> Our society will not help you be on guard against all kinds of covetousness. Rather, they'll help you fall into the trap of it. What is all kinds of, of covetous? R real quick, what I can get. We think about what I can get. You just got some money because you just worked hard. What can I get? You're already thinking about what you can get. We live in a me-centered world, right? It's mentality. Go get what you can get. Go get what you, wh wh whatever you want, you can go get it. I said before, we're going into election year. Dear Jesus, help us all. We'll be listening to all the candidates and all their promises. And guess what? They will not save your soul. And not only that, we've got to be careful that we're not out for our own self-centered ways. That is what has made America falter. is because we're so selfish now. We're not in it for the common good of one another and working with things that actually work. It's all about the money. Every single campaign, a promise, every, every issue that's out there, it's all based on lining somebody's pocket. It's the love of money. The next one that we think about that we've got to be careful of is what I should have. Ever hear somebody say, well, I deserve this. Do you? Really? Is that, a third, is that a first world problem? I'm not saying, you know, there's a good use for that. But man, sometimes I've heard, oh, I deserve this vacation. But you, but you didn't pay your phone bill. You don't deserve nothing. Right? I deserve this new furniture. Okay, but not if it's going to put you $10,000 into debt. You don't deserve nothing, right? We, but, but, I, but, I, but I should have that, right? And then we start, another kind of covenant what I don't have. Well, Shirley has this, but I don't, and that's not fair. Well, the, the Norris's over, they, they just did all this stuff in their house. We don't have that stuff in our house. Why don't we have that stuff in our house? We compare and we covet, and we start to think, about what others have. And now our pursuits and our thoughts, our hopes and all of that are influenced by what others have. And so we start to set the direction of our lives to get what others have. He got a new truck. I want a new truck. I want new golf clubs. You don't even play golf. Yeah, but he's got golf clubs, right? We start to compare and covet what others have. We actually then, when we do that, make them to be our God. You want to know why? The reason we make them our God is because we start listening to all that they have and we start following suit. Wow. You don't listen to God's voice regarding your money, you're going to listen to your neighbor's voice. 
You listen to that friend on Facebook because you see all of the joy that it's bringing them. You listen to that family member's voice that you've been competing with for many years now. Robert Morris said, don't let someone else spend your money. Let God tell you how to spend your money. The Apostle Paul, he throws this one in there, 1 Timothy chapter 6, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires and that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. I have seen this straight up. I've watched people warn people that their desire for money will lead them to destruction. There have been people in my life who are no longer living because their desire to be rich, because money talks and God's voice was confused for covetousness, it led people away from Christ. And down into these difficulty, into these pangs, into destruction. I cannot begin to tell you how much my heart hurts when I, when, when I see people listen to the voice of money over God. Because it will rip you off. Covetousness is a sign of resentment towards God and jealousy towards others. You resent God because you don't have this. You didn't get this. And you're jealous of those who have it. It becomes a super ugly thing in a person's life. It's a craving for more when you already have enough. It resents the goodness of God in your life because you think others have more. Money is not evil. And we're going to talk about that the next couple of weeks. But the mo love of money is. It is the root of all kinds of evil. Money talks, but so does God. Am I letting God's voice be the direction in my life. Ephesians 5.5 5 puts covetousness in the same category as sexual immorality. Neither will inherit the kingdom of God, it says. It's not a small thing to God. The voice of money overpowers but under, or overpromises but underpays. America is the most depressed nation in the world. It's also the most in debt nation in the world. You want to know why we're so darn depressed? It's because once the high of whatever we just bought or whatever we just got runs, runs, runs off, it fades away, we're left with ourselves again. And we just bought a bunch of stuff that we don't really need. Come on, somebody. Hebrews 13, 5 says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Money talks, but so does God. And God is saying, I will never leave you. I will not forsake you. God's saying, I promise. I'm faithful. I will not desert you. I won't let you go. I won't give up on you. Not now, not ever. Money will both leave you and it will forsake you. Don't give your love to it. Don't get enticed by it. Don't get pulled by it. Be confident in who your supplier is. And that's God himself. Philippians 4, 19 says, My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in, Christ, in glory in Christ Jesus. Do you, know Je do you know this of Jesus personally? Do you know him to be your provider? Do you know that? Or do you look to, to money to do God's job? Here's what I know. God always guides and God always provides. Always. But do you trust his voice? Or do you trust that money is the thing that's going to take care of you? Do you trust that it's money that will lead you to an abundant life? I can honestly look back at my life. And every time I've listened to the voice of money, it's led me to difficulty in my life. But when I listen to the voice of God and his leading, God has been so faithful through and through. He's been my provider. Close to 20 years ago, not too long after Jenny and I moved back here, we were newly married. We bought our first home. We were doing what God called us to do, living in his will. 
Things were tight, very tight back then. My salary was next to nothing. Jenny had a good job as a nurse. Like, her salary literally doubled mine. We're not talking about that, and there's no bitterness or anything like that. All right? No pride. We were very frugal in this season of life. Like, I literally, we kept, like, the house at 58 degrees in the wintertime. Because we discovered that our house had zero insulation. It was an icebox, but God provided a friend of mine, his name is Mark, brother in the Lord, he worked at an insulation company and he would bring over the leftover, the leftover insulation tubs that they would use to spray. So they couldn't use them at other jobs so they would just get wasted. And he did my whole basement for free, like you could literally see the wind down there. Did it for all of it. Not long after this, we received news that we're going to have our first baby. What an exciting time it was. We started getting everything ready. Until over halfway through the pregnancy, we found that our daughter had no heartbeat. Medical bills and funeral expenses came up, and we didn't have too much. We had God. Something else happened, though. We lost our daughter, and we also, uh, we also had another big expense happen, and we lost our washing machine. No comparison by any means, but it was during a time where we were ready, really, really just making it. We didn't know where, how this money was, you know, w- would come through and how we'd be able to fix it. But we found out that basically to fix it, it's going to cost as much as a new washing machine. And we're like, oh my goodness, like... It's terrible. But we continue to tr- serve and trust God. And lo and behold, Jenny's grandfather, Grandpa Claude, didn't know about our washing machine. But simply because he loved us and cared so much for us and just the pain that we had walked through, he sent us a $1,000 check in the mail. It took care of everything that we needed in that moment. Fast forward a little bit, God had blessed us with our son Leland, and our next son Hudson was on the way, another exciting time, two weeks out, but God put it in our hearts to take two teens in our home because their mother couldn't take care of them any longer. I've shared it before. We went from one kid to four kids in the matter of two weeks. You do the math. I had to sell my car for a minivan. Come on. And I have not been free since. (laughs) We had no idea how we'd get through. God did because he guides and provides. God put someone in our path that helped us to navigate through the foster care system. A dear friend of ours. Somebody that God, God put there for us. It was a blessing in our lives. God used him to help us. God provided. I can go on with testimony after testimony of how God poured in and provided in our lives. Money didn't do that. God did it. I mean, I could tell you so many crazy stories of uh, not even like money, but how God provides in other ways. You know, in that season, Jenny and I were talking about it last night, in that season when we went from two kids and and they were 15 months apart, Leland and Hudson, to then two teenagers, we were actually very nervous, like, because we're like, how are we going to ever have any time to ourselves? Like, how is that going to even work, like, in our own home? Like, and, 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 and it was crazy because the two teenagers loved to go to bed really early. And so we, we even had that time. We prayed about having time. God provides in ways that, let me just... He'll do it because it's who he is. Because his promise is that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Listen to his voice, not the voice of this world, not the voice of money, not the voice of what he or she has. Don't listen to the voice of money. Listen to the voice of God because he shows up every single time. 
every time. And if you don't know that of him today, I just want you to simply pray in your heart, say, God, I want to know you this way. I don't want to listen to what this world has to offer and what this world is giving. I want to listen to your voice and your voice alone. Maybe some of you have been following the Lord for years, but maybe even this area of your life has gotten a little bit stale. You're not see, you, you, you're blessed and you live a good life and all that, but you're really not seeing the miraculous hand of God moving in your life. You're not seeing kingdom things happening. I'm just going to ask that we would recommit to knowing God as our provider in this season of our lives together. Because he'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's who he wants you to know him as, as your provider. It's his job. And he takes great pride in that job. He loves you so much. And he's willing. But you've got to say, okay, God, I trust you. I trust you over the voice of money in my life.